Okay, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to this week's edition of Imperial as One's Belonging series, where we explore the experiences of the Black, Asian and ethnic minority communities and their sense of um, gaining a sense of belonging. And this week, I've had the pleasure of having a talk with um, Jan Etienne, and she's going to be our guest. And Jan is an associate lecturer at the School of Social Sciences and um, History at Birkbeck University. And she's done a number, for a number of years, she's been working on womenist issues. So I'm not going to steal her thunder. But I'm going to ask and um, just say another big welcome to Jan. And I didn't know where to start with our conversation, but I'm going to start where I usually start, which is at the beginning and ask you to give us a little sense of your how you developed your sense of belonging when you were growing up. So in your home, what, where, where did that sense of belonging come from? OK, good afternoon to you, Wayne. Thank you. I'm just so delighted to be here at this event. It's such an important event, crucial, in fact, especially at this time. Thank you. Well, my word, you've thrown me back into my childhood, into life at home. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to begin by saying that I grew up in a fairly matriarchal household. Um, I had a mother, a very strong mother, who led from the top. Right. I was the only girl in a household of four boys, my father, my mother. And I have to say that, you know, my mother instilled in me this sense of responsibility right. for the family. Mm -hmm. That's what it was all about mm -hmm. for my mother. Mm -hmm. um, it was very much the responsibility for doing all the, the usual, the chores, the washing, the cooking, looking after my young brother, um, my young disabled brother, yeah. um, not just the responsibility of having a brother, you know, with special needs, mm -hmm. but it was the wider responsibility of my three other brothers. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as belonging is concerned, you know, this thing about family life, mm -hmm. this thing about, you know, seeing, you know, responsibility, mm -hmm. being this sense of duty, mm -hmm. um, you know, was very much, you know, what I felt um, was in me. And I needed also to think about the injustice in all of that. The fact that my brothers, for example, got away with so much in terms of the hard work and everything else. Um, but for me, I think life kind of, you know, began um, from the point of view of um, exploring social justice, the point of view of looking specifically at women's rights, thinking very carefully about the sorts of things that my parents went through. My father worked at Forbes, mm -hmm. Dagenham, on the assembly line. My mother had three jobs. She worked in the National Health Service. She worked at, as an elderly person's home. She worked at the Hornsey Town Hall as a cleaner. Yeah. And so, so much of what my mother was doing, you know, as far as she was concerned, she was working out there and I was the girl child with all the responsibilities at home. So you were, could, could if I don't if you don't mind me interjecting, you almost became the substitute mother at home. So you were a, a, almost like her miniature clone. Is is that right? So she would be out working, and you were at home responsible for looking after the rest of the household. Absolutely. I mean, of course, at the time, Wayne, I didn't think about it in that way. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, very much about doing what partly what you were told mm -hmm. but I also felt that you know I was you know this kind of equal parent mm -hmm. to some extent mm -hmm. um, but it didn't leave me I don't know it didn't leave me feeling too bitter at the time mm -hmm. it was later on 
when in my teens, mm-hmm. you know, when one started to um, get out there and mix with others, that I realized that it wasn't only me in this position. As somebody who came from the Caribbean, who was born in St. Lucia, came over at a young age to take on board that responsibility. I didn't know anything else Mm. in a sense. Um, And in a way, I think I got excited about seeing how the other half lived, Mm -hmm. as it were, when I refer to the other half. You know, this is about my peers. Mm -hmm. Um, This is about those who were not doing what I was doing. Yeah. And what was really interesting is that I spent so much of my time um, away from that at night, you yeah. know, reading at night, you know, this was my kind of escape, mm-hmm. you know. Um, it was very much that I needed to, you know, put myself in, you know, looking at what was going on. There were, time out was very live at the time, and I found that such a fascinating interesting at the time um, magazine to be able to, you know, get a sense of life out there, life that I think I really yearned for. So in so, terms of, so in terms of like, um, you said about your peers, so this was mm-hmm. when you were in your, so secondary school, etc. Mm-hmm. How, how, how did you feel accepted within them? How was that connection was there a connection and how how did, how did you um develop um yeah. during that time uh-huh. okay most interesting Wayne, because life at school i felt was my real life um i went to an all girls school right. and um i you know this was such a fabulous time for me um whilst you know there will be those who talk about hating school Um, This was where I really found myself. Um, I really feel that I could um, not just engage with um, subjects such as British constitution, classical studies, Greek literature. Um, I really enjoyed my time speaking closely with others. I mean, in that particular time was very much, the most exciting time was in sixth form college. Um, It was, you know, very much centered around um, the lives of um, a generation like myself who um, were not born in the UK. My school was a grammar school originally. The year I went to that school, it became a um, comprehensive school. Right. And so from moving from perhaps all white pupils to a time where the school was actually flooded with black students, right. large numbers of black students. Mm-hmm. What you had was teaching staff who were used to teaching one set of students teaching um, Hornsey High School was quite a, I would say, prestigious school at one time. Mm-hmm. Almost that we came and we kind of roughed it up, <laughs> built it a little bit. Um, I think some of the teachers were probably afraid to teach us. We had a very stern headmistress um, who tried her best to, you know, get us schooled in a particular way. I must admit, there were times, you know, when I reflect on this, that it was almost like, you know, teaching the savages to become, you know, sensible um, girls, ladies. Um, And so in this whole kind of um, comprehensive, you know, setup, what I enjoyed was mixing, you know, with um, fellow pupils who had a similar background. I mean, there was stuff going on, but, you know, which we, I would say, ignored to a large extent. The very Mm -hmm. same way that my mother ignored the racist patients 
yeah. the very same way that my father ignored, you know, the kind of um, racism that he experienced at work. Mm -hmm. I think at school, you know, you know, we we knew that there were times where things were pretty bad. Mm -hmm. We ignored it. So that sense of belonging, you know, came from those um, fellow pupils um, reading together, mm -hmm. doing things that were, would take us away from our home situation, you know, and open us up to, you know, some interesting stuff. Yes, it was the fact that we were all in those various tutor groups. And those tutor groups were famous white women. Yeah. Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. I was in a Nightingale group, Florence Nightingale. Yeah. And so much of that um, went by the by, you know, the structures were there in place, but we lived life in that school arena. Right. We had a lot in common. So I'll so just stop there. Moment. Yes. Yeah. No. So, so you said you mentioned about how when you got to school you gained that sense of belonging because it was kind of like outside of the normality of what was happening in the home, and it gave you an opportunity to almost like expand your your horizons to look beyond. How did mm -hmm. your parents view education and where education could take you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my father was very strict on education. Um, he, the usual, what Caribbean, West Indian families would do. He bought a set of 12 encyclopedias for the household. And he expected us children um, to read these encyclopedias from cover, from front to cover. <laughs> um, having said that, you know, the sorts of stuff at the time in those encyclopedias. Um, I remember reading about the brains of the black man. Um, I remember thinking at the time, you know, even then, you know, that was rather strange, you know. Mm -hmm. I felt that, you know, it was inferior sort of positionings in so much of that. But mm -hmm. having said that, my parents, um, both my mother as well, um, they wanted me to excel in school, in education, from the time I, um, I attended Brokesley Primary School in Hornsey. Um, and I remember, you know, my mother speaking to the teachers um, and basically, you know, um, you know, almost like, you know, telling them that, you know, they'd have, they have, they've got to get me through this education system. I don't, I must admit, I don't ever remember um, learning the basics of ABC and it was, I, I think my education in St. Lucia was pretty basic at the time. Mm -hmm. So my actual learning came in the secondary school sector mm -hmm. um, when I had some good, um, helpful teachers. Mm -hmm. I was interested in literature um, and I, you know, was very much, um, you know, passionate you know, about um, literature. I, I ended up, I went on to sixth form college mm -hmm. um, and I ended up with 10 CSEs, eight O levels, two A levels. Um, but my parents saw this whole education system as being just in school. Mm. Their thoughts on higher education university, that was nothing. That didn't come in their vocabulary at all. Yeah. Um, this was about school, the compulsory um, system, mm -hmm. um, the unpaid for system um, was my education. I was so, in a way, excited, delighted that I got to stay on in sixth form college because um, some of um, white students in particular, um, you know, as soon as they got an opportunity to leave school, that was it. But to be in the sixth form college to continue. It was almost like my freedom, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Take myself away from home, you know, go to school and, you know, live life, you know? Um, that was then. So, and so education for my parents, highest education at the time 
was indeed school. So, so they didn't have any expectations of you going on to, to higher education, to university in any way, shape or form. What was their expectation and how did that feel for you? Because it sounds to me that you had a passion for, for learning and it was opening up, especially, as you said, during sixth form. So to go on. So how, how was that for you? OK. Um, oh, dear. It's... Um... I mean, it's a really sort of strange thing because at the time um, I was this, you know, very sort of sensible young um, girl who did everything my parents expected of me, you know, because mm -hmm. I know the sacrifice that yeah. they, yes, it was that kind of thing. So I had this sort of sense, um, but also this burning desire to sort of, get myself sorted out later. When I say get myself sorted out, um, I knew I wanted more education. I knew I wanted to learn um, mm -hmm. so much more. Um, this was about doing things um, later, almost behind my parents' backs. Right. You know, again, you know, it's unusual to say that this kind of, you know, so there wasn't any bitterness, there wasn't any sort of anger, but mm -hmm. I knew that um, I needed to do something about my independence. Yeah. When I say about this matriarchal household, my mother was the person who found me a job. Yes, she actually got me a job working at um, Hornsey Town Hall. Um, and I worked, I started life as a clerical assistant at the right. time because um, the borough engineer, a very nice man, Mr. Stevenson, who my mother worked for, she cleaned his office. Mm -hmm. She asked him for a job for her daughter. Yeah. And okay, back then it was possible. So <laughs> I got a full time job. Um, and I found myself in local government. You know, I, you know, I worked for Haringey Council and I was very pleased. I, you know, things were fine. I left school at 18. Um, and then eventually, you know, the, you know, the courage of sort of, you know, saying, listen, mom, it's time that I held on to my pay packet, you know, <laughs> family, things were tough, things yeah. were very tough, big family, household, you know, stuff to do to get on with. Um, so when I left home at the age of um, 20, yes, um, this was where it all began for me. Right. Um, but I, yes, I mean, life took so many different I don't know, I, I started, you know, getting this real sense of, you know, where I am today, you know, yeah. particularly in relation to my research, particularly in relation to, you know, doing degrees later in life, you know, finding myself um, doing so much, you know, um, for, I would say, community. I want to tell you, Wayne, how that started. Because, Please you know, do, yeah. Yes, I, I yeah. want to say to you, um, in 1983, um, I went on, this was the best time of my life. <laughs> I have to say the best time of my life. Um, working in Grenada. Mm -hmm. okay. This was at a time where I, I was working for an organization called Ujima, um, for sister project called Harambi. At the time um, we went over to Grenada um, with a, an organization called Tools for Self-Reliance. And this was very much about working on projects. You know, I'm sort of jumping a bit just to say to you that I think, you know, my passion, my desire, my sort of sense of social um, injustice as well came about from that time in Grenada working alongside um, people like Jacqueline Kreft, um, who was the Minister for Education, and somebody who was um, very much interested in women's rights. She had a responsibility in women's affairs in the Morris Bishop um, government. So at the time, we almost, you know, I was part of a youth exchange, a youth project that went over to Grenada um, to work with young people, to work um, rebuilding um, the island after the hurricane. It was very much uh, a time for me 
to get a sense of where I always kind of knew I was, but working alongside, you know, somebody who I considered at the time as my mentor. Right. Um, I mean, so much of what um, Maurice Bishop and Jacqueline Krepp were all about at that time was about emancipation. It was about um, independence for the island of Grenada. It was about, you know, attempting, you know, to deal with so much um, in terms of this imperialistic, you know, structures, you know, which existed. The mm -hmm. American dominance at the time, for me as a young woman, you know, working um, with, with these individuals really opened my eyes, my mind to some of the stuff that was taking place in relation to education. At that time, um, the Cuban government assisted the island with books, with our materials for schools. So we were supported as a group of 14. Um, and that time, you know, spent in Grenada, um, I think, you know, gave me a sort of a fascinating sort of insight into what I knew in my heart already um, was something that I, I wanted to do in terms of serving community, in terms of making certain that the sorts of discussions, the sorts of things that I felt that I was privy to during that time, I was in a position to take elsewhere. I don't think I had that much time to, um, to really explore the thinking of others. I mean, this is what I feel is so crucial right now, listening yeah. to those other experiences. Yeah. I'm listening to young men talk about being in the militia, mm -hmm. serving, you know, their country. And somebody like Maurice Bishop, like Jacqueline Kreft, telling us what it was like, the reality. I don't think I got that sense um, from any of the experiences that I had in school, although I have to admit that, you know, I had some really interesting, good um, tutors. So when I came back from that experience, this is what, you know, took me on to becoming a local councillor, for example, yeah. to work in, in a sector, you know, which was very much, um, I worked as a race relations advisor in Haringey. I worked as a head of a race um, equality and housing unit in the London borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. I worked as a women's rights officer in the London borough of Hackney. And this was their first time um, at the time, you know, my, um, perhaps my, I'd say my line manager at the time, although she was a local councillor then, Linda Bellos, um, chaired um, our committee. And so, in a way, I think that Grenada experience really um, took me in a direction, you know, which I felt I wanted to go into. I never felt that I had sufficient enough education. Right. And so constantly, you know, this sort of desire. I went on to the University of Bristol um, to study policy studies. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, I thought that policy studies, you know, would be a way of helping to deal with some of those concerns which I felt existed. Um, but then I realized soon after that, you know, this was pretty much of a solo thing, you know, this thing about working on the ground with others, with women, working on the ground with community activists was where my passion really was. Right. Um, and so my time as a local councillor in Brent um, was a good one. It was, I was chair of the education committee in the London borough of Brent. And I think some of the things that I wanted um, to achieve, some of the people that I wanted to help, you know, take me further on that journey to influence change to some extent. Um, this was a loony left, so-called loony left authority. Um, the likes of Ken Livingstone, um, the likes of, you know, individuals who were, who had a passion, who were sort of very interested in the sorts of sentiments that came out of the GLC um, politics. 
But at the same time, I must admit, I didn't um, see myself as that, you know, radical um, individual. I saw myself a little bit as a machine politician at that particular stage. Um, but anyway, I'll stop there for a moment. So I, I was going to just pick up on that point about the machine politician. What kind of machine? Was it kind of like, um, yes. were you just so engaged with trying to get social justice that you were metronomic in your approach to to what you were doing how how, how did you develop yes well it's not my terminology it really isn't um it's almost like a critique to some extent um somebody who i worked with for a little while a Sivanandan, Asib Sivanandan, mm -hmm. um, from Race and Class, um, the Institute of Race Relations, um, shared an awful lot about individuals like myself at the time mm -hmm. who worked for local authorities, who were engaged in the ideals of others. And when I refer to others, um, significant mm -hmm. others in relation to politics, local politics, who had a particular vision, particular vision of the world, mm -hmm. yes, in relation to, you know, what we should do to improve the positions of women, what we should do um, to take on board, you know, those wider issues around discriminative practices. So from Asif Sivanandan's point of view, they would employ those individuals who became like machine politicians to do their work. But to some extent, it was almost, and you know, I really, really feel that, you know, this is so significant at the time, um, because at that particular time, it was a massive race relations industry mm -hmm. in most of the London labor controlled local authorities. Um, and I think not just, I remember, you know, when I worked in Hackney, for example, um, I worked closely with um, individuals who are now today, um, what others might call, you know, those classic um, team politicians, um, where, you know, they have, you know, I'm not saying they don't have the passion, they don't have the commitment, but um, it may be, that they are heading a disability unit. They're heading a lesbian and gay um, unit. They're heading a women's unit and so on. And in a way, their work is there internally. All the stuff that's happening out there on the front line, on the ground, um, it is all, it's not always that those messages filter through the organization. Yeah filter yeah. through to those individuals. Mm -hmm. But um, it's also very interesting to say that um, some of my engagements also um, involved um, time with Stuart Hall, not mm -hmm. a professor at that time, but somebody who, again, you know, gave me that kind of um, vision to appreciate, you know, so much more in terms of education, in terms of you know, learning an awful lot more. You know, I think we surprise ourselves. We don't realize, that, you know, we are, you know, we find ourselves stuck in particular areas. And until, you know, we get that opportunity to um, disseminate our ideas, to hear what others have to say, to look, you know, um, you know, to remove ourselves from the margins, to look on the outside. Mm -hmm. um, Stuart Hall sort of gave me that sense that it was not about, you know, just the sort of um, Thatcherite sort of politics, you know, which was the problem, mm -hmm. but the problem was very much about, you know, what we did, how we engage, how we collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, um, the most sort of important thing in all of this was this sense of who we were. So somebody like Bernie Grant, mm -hmm. who was the leader of the council in Haringey at the time, um, who once again, you know, shared, you know, this 
with me this sense of um, duty and um, responsibility for the wider um, community. Um, this business of, for example, black sections in the Labour Party, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, part of my own sort of research was very much around sort of looking at why there was a need to have a separate, you know, black section yeah. inside a political party. Mm -hmm. And Wayne, I have to say that I soon learned the reasons for that and why mm -hmm. this was highly necessary. Mm -hmm. Why, you know, it was important until we begin to have those separate entities um, talk amongst ourselves, um, deal with those critical issues. Black sections did not win the battle, but um, um, my own sort of research more or less um, took the sense that working with the left was perhaps the only way at the time to um, get a sense of where working class communities, where we all were, mm -hmm. black, white working class communities, um, how we were able to sort of get through the system to be able to deal with representation. Um, and that representation, you know, was a challenge. <clears throat> the only issue for me was that um, most of the people I worked with at the time, it was that whites, white people needed to get council seats first. Right. They were the priority. And then it was black men needed to right. get there. And then it was black women at the very bottom. Okay, so um, throughout my time in local politics, um, of course, it was a challenge. It was a battle. So that's not what you want to be at at this stage. I'm sure you want to move on. No, 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 it's, um, we go where the conversation leads us. That's as far as how I see it. But there was a couple of points which you, you made there, um, especially towards the end where you were, were mentioning about almost like the hierarchical structure with black women being in terms of the pecking order, they were the last ones. And you mentioned yeah. a number of, of people who I, I class as being highly influential, Stuart Hall and Bernie Grant. Um, so being in their company and having yeah. or trying to find this safe space, do you feel that as a, as a black woman that your voice wasn't as highly valued or as, as heard as the others who you, were, who you were there with? And has that kind of like influenced or helped to influence your um, research passions, which you're, you, you, you've been doing for a number of years? Mm, okay. Um, I must acknowledge that, um, you know, whilst I am very much sort of mindful of the nature of sexism, um, in my own community, my own black community, mm -hmm. um, I feel that I, in the whole, the whole womanist agenda is very much about community first. Right. About race, yes, it's about acknowledging double discrimination, uh, but more so that, you know, struggle is a collective struggle, yes? Mm -hmm. And this is not downplaying um, how we sort of move on to sort of dealing with um, how we have, we as black women have that responsibility, um, perhaps more of a responsibility um, to take others with us, you know, including understanding, appreciating the position of black men, what black men go through in this society. But it is very much, the fact that um, I had total respect for individuals such as Morris Bishop, such as Stuart Paul, such as Bernie Brown, Paul Boateng, um, and in their company, I must say that I didn't um, feel, you know, that sense of injustice, right? Because I felt 
that they got the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. I felt that they understood the reality of my um, position. Um, I mean, in all the sorts of um, issues which Asif Sivanandan, for example, made mm -hmm. it quite clear that, um, you know, we, you know, this, what we talk about now in terms of critical race theory, all that sort of early, you know, discussion was around, you know, the structure, the common sort of enemy of institutional um, racism. And so I, my sense, um, I, I go back to the sorts of things that I felt so much more comfortable with, um, you know, once again, um, going back to that Grenada experience mm. and working um, alongside um, an individual who um, understood that there was a position that black women had. I mean, at the time, you know, we don't talk about um, the separation in terms of black, white, um, at a local level in some of those projects that I worked within. But this was very much that, you know, where were women? Women were there um, teaching others. Um, my experience was about, it was working with older black women to assist in their sort of re-education. Mm -hmm. um, the power of education at that time. I mean, it was about girls' education. It mm -hmm. was going back to this old mantra about, you know, educate um, the woman, the girl child, and, you know, it's like how we are able to benefit um, mm -hmm. from all of that. So I was never, you know, one of those um, radical feminists mm -hmm. from the point of view of hating men mm -hmm. and hating, you know, this... You know, the struggle was a struggle which was around, you know, black, the black community. Mm -hmm. The struggle was very, very um, different. But having said that, you know, from a research point of view, um, from my own sort of experience, um, having spent so much time working at um, an institution which is about widening participation, mm -hmm. I spent several years um, working in community projects, working in further education colleges, um, seeing where young black women were, seeing where older black women were, and the fact that they had been denied education, mm -hmm. not just because of the family responsibilities, not just, you know, this is, you know, Wayne, you're really getting me to think about this. Um, sometimes, you know, you don't spend time thinking about what you see, um, and I really feel that, you know, what I saw in places like um, in my family life, you know, what I saw was that, you know, women were getting a raw deal. Um, I felt from my point of view that, you know, the education, the time, you know, for us to make a contribution, you know, was now, you know, the time for us to do an awful lot more. And I think you know, I see myself as a little bit of a sort of um, spokesperson, you know, somebody who um, can assist in that development yeah. in terms of opening um, women up to this world, which they probably, um, in some instances, not in all instances, that they have not acknowledged their rightful place. But I've always felt that, you know, it was the same way that I felt about, you know, having this passion to do more, to know more, to learn more. You know, I saw how this could help me um, explore um, so much more and also benefit um, other sisters in the process. So it is first-hand experience. I'm not saying that I have experienced sort of such atrocities um, of course, you know, being a senior um, manager in local government is not an easy yeah. um, task. Um, you spend your time with these large SMT, senior management team meetings, um, the only black face, um, one of maybe just three women, and, um, you know, you're the last to be heard. Yeah. Um, and I also felt that why education was important I think at the time, I didn't feel that I was confident enough to challenge. 
And this is why education for me is so crucial because um, you're not able um, to get through um, if you do not have that type of lifelong learning mm -hmm. education. Um, you know, I never felt that, you know, it was enough. Yeah. So the womanist angle came, you know, very much about um, attempting um, to engage other women like myself into the frame to demonstrate, you know, that power of education um, and how, you know, it can assist in taking us further. When I was in Brent, um, I remember spending an awful lot of time in a local authority which um, was one of the most diverse in the country and speaking to parents, majority black parents, about the fact that we had a massive problem in Brent at the time yeah. with regards to school exclusions. Um, and it was, this was the only way that, um, you know, we could, you know, find ways to reduce in, you know, that numbers by yeah. understanding what was going on, mm. the reality of the situation. But um, so much of our time, you know, for example, as black women, it is that we feel that, um, we need to let others, those who know better, take responsibility, either for our children, mm. for our lives. And I think um, my time in Brent sort of really demonstrated that, you know, parents needed to be heard. They needed to, um, we needed to understand what was going on. Yeah. Um, because, as I say, you know, it the struggles um, of trying to put food on the table, trying to have enough money, sort of skews everything else. You know, I saw my education being denied because yeah, my role in the home was too important. Yeah. Um, so, but I think um, I'm somebody who goes with what I, I feel I kind of best able yeah. to push through on. There yeah. are others who are dealing with that bigger picture. I feel as far as black women's education, as far as black women's research, you know, this is what I feel I can make a positive contribution to. Yes, yes. You know what? I could sit and I could talk with you for hours. I know I could, because you've got so much insight. Um, but I'm just wary of our time. I've, we've already yes. got over, but that, that's fine. I'm just going to see if there's there's anyone in the audience who'd like to ask a question because I still have more but we're, we're kind of out of time um but if there's one or two people who have a question that they'd like to ask then if you just raise your hands and then we'll come to you All right, I've got Moon Lee has put her hand up so Moon Lee if you want to ask your question first and then if anyone else if you put your hand up and then we'll we'll address those questions now thank you Thank you, Wei. Hey, Jan. I don't know if you remember me. <laughs> yes, I remember you. Moon Lee, my Education Plan Social Change student. Very nice to see you. Nice to see you too after all these years. I'm, I'm glad I had the honour to attend your lectures in person when it was in person. <laughs> nice um, I remember like from uh, when we talked about, uh, you know, like, like, you know, talking about our own student's journey, what got you into studying uh, in our lecture. And I wonder what got you into research, because I remember quite well that you, you start, you know, you went into research as a mature student, didn't you? Uh, and I just wonder what made you and pushed you to go into postgraduate research. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Moonly, it's kind of, um, it's such a sort of helpful question at this stage because it's reminded me of the fact that, um, yes, you were an MSc student at Birkbeck, an establishment which was all about, um, you know, getting almost that second chance for the vast majority of our students. Um, those who perhaps missed on, miss out on education at a particular time. So for me, I, um, it all started with that, you know, community activism. Um, I worked at the time for an organization which 
Um, you may have heard of this organization. organization. It's AHAG, Africa Refugee Housing. And um, at one time, um, I worked also um, as a research assistant for um, the Institute for Policy Studies at um, London Metropolitan University. I worked for an organization, again, part-time London Development Agency. Um, so we had a bit of a time where we were looking, we were concerned about black staff in further education and concerned about black managers. And at the time, it was about how individuals, how individual black managers were making the grade or not making the grade as it were. During that time, um, and you know, I'm going back to later um, PhD research, those various projects sort of ignited, you know, in me a sort of passion to do stuff for myself as opposed to doing it on behalf of others. When you are working for organizations where you are, um, you're not totally involved in the strategy, the overall strategy. You know, I found myself doing things, working as a field work researcher as an assistant, um, going through the motions. At the time I felt that, you know, this could be done differently in order to achieve such and such. I worked on longitudinal projects, um, a year, two years, some as short as six months, constantly going back, revisiting um, individuals and projects. Um, I really got a lot out of that because at least, you know, I got that opportunity to really get to know, to see what was going on. Um, yes, I did my PhD late. And the reason if I go back, when I say late, later in my years, I go back to um, working for um, Birkbeck at the time, Bill, which is the Birkbeck Institute for Lifelong Learning. And what um, we had this opportunity, I had an opportunity to um, work as a research officer. Um, and I conducted a nine month study um, inside the Women's Institutes, this country's biggest organization, voluntary organization for women. And so throughout all my time there, you know, this was the time when the Women's Institute was totally white. You know, I didn't come across any um, black women at the time, but I spend a lot of time with white middle-class women. I'm hearing about their life, their learning journeys. The majority of these women had first degrees. Um, so this pushed me to want to do my own thing, you know? So my own research is around older generation, first generation African Caribbean women. Completely different experience to that of the Women's Institute. Very, very different. Here you had the sort of polite white women who did it all in a very structured way. Here I had, you know, women <clears throat> who reminded me of my mother, who, you know, dealt with me as if I was their child, who sort of, you know, taught cats well, cussed me in a particular way. Um, very different. They interrupted my questioning. They had their own questioning. That experience, very, very different. So, as I say, it's those particular experiences that got me to doing my own thing, wanting to conduct research, wanting to do it differently. Moonly, there's so much I can talk to you about that experience, but I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Moon Lee, thank you for that question and Jan for the answer. It was, it was, it sounds to me as though that inspiration of um, or speaking with those women helped mm. you to find your voice through fi them finding their voice. You got it, Wayne. Yeah. You got it. Um, and this is where I am today, you know, around this collaborative approach um, to contemporary womanist research. Oh my word, voice, hearing those women, you know, giving them those platforms. Um, I think, you know, letting them, you know, talk the talk. Um, oh, powerful. 
Um, and so this is why, you know, I've got this conference coming up on International Women's Day in March. You know, it's just a shame it's online, but, you know, that conference, I hope, you know, will open up, you know, this, where we're actually at with regards to that voice, with regards to how, you know, we're able to celebrate Black women's voices in research. Um, powerful. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll advertise that through our network as well to make sure as many people can attend um, that event. I see that we've got one more question from William and then that's going to be our last, I'm afraid. But William, if you could um, ask your question. And thanks, Moonlee, that was excellent. Yeah, it's kind of been um, answered, but I mean, okay. you know, but I was trying to get it in a different way. I mean, Jan, I mean, he's like, it feels like you've had like, like um, a lifetime of careers <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, and so many experiences where you have supported others but like now at this stage of life it's like like as you expressed you know you found your voice and now you're running a network so I just wanted to I says how does that feel for you and what would you say to other black women that are trying to navigate their way through mm -hmm. a white supremacist patriarchal yes. structure? How would you, what would you, what advice would you give to them on how to navigate? Mm. Yes. Oh, William, wonderful to, to hear your voice. I can't see you, but wonderful to hear it. Um, William, I, it's, it's very um, interesting that you should say this. I, you know, I was saying that to others the other day that self-actualization is where I feel that I'm at at the moment because this womanism, higher activism, higher education research network allows me to um, communicate with women all over the globe. You know, that's a good thing I would say about this whole COVID situation now is that, you know, people are there. They get to these online meetings and um, whatever, you know, wherever they are. And I think, um, you know, I feel that it's important, you know, for others, everybody, you know, not just black women to think about, you know, where their own activism um, came from, where it emerged. Um, it is, you know, we often don't re realize that, you know, there is a form of activism going on. Um, and that kind of, you know, wherever we position it, you know, let's just think about, you know, it, I think, um, you know, it may have sort of that activism may have, you know, started, you know, without we knowing it in our childhood, you know, we, it may have been in a particular working environment that we come across, not just the physically sort of working on the frontline organizations, but something that's happening in conversations with people, things that we feel at ease about, things that we feel comfortable with. Um, I have had lots of mixed sort of feelings in my own um, life. Um, I thought that my area was um, parliament, going into parliament. Um, and I stood for parliament in 2005, um, thinking that, and also because other people told me, hey, Jan, you should, you know, this, do this. But, you know, once again, you know, you kind of need to figure it out for yourself, you know, what it is that you really feel, how you can contribute in a particular way, where your calling is. So, um, for me, um, it is so important to have that set of good, um, helpful people around you, people that you have a lot in common with. Um, my goodness me, it has been tough in local government. It has been tough dealing with the pain, um, not just of rejection, but the pain of sort of daily working life, to be able to share, you know, experiences, to deal with issues of trust, you know, to deal with um, the letdowns, to talk about it, speak openly about it. Um, you know, yes, I feel that I am at a good place and I feel brave enough to be able to um, challenge, um, you know, what I see as injustice. Um, but most importantly, you know, I feel I'm at the stage where I can open up to understand, you know, what white lecturers, for example, go through when they are talking about race, when they are delivering lectures in a particular way. So this is about education for others, education for colleagues as well. That is hugely important. 
That's Jan. William, once again, you've asked a, a brilliant question. And Jan, that was a superb answer. I don't even know what more to say. There are so many, as William said, you've had a lifetime of, of experiences, uh, which we, couldn't, we can't condense into to the amount of time. I'm going to have to call you back on and we can explore another aspect because um, I really do feel that there's so much more um, so much insight that you've given to us about hearing voices, hearing the woman's voice and understanding how we can empower each other by listening. Because if we don't listen, we don't hear. And if we don't hear, we won't respond. And some people, even if they say they're listening, they're not listening. I'm gonna ask you one final question, right? And this question is, what advice would you give to your younger self, your seven, 16, 17, 18 year old self about what they could expect. Mm, okay. Um, that, this is about, um, for me, um, I wish I had the opportunity to challenge earlier. I wish I had the courage to speak out earlier. Um, and so the advice would be to make certain that you are reading sufficiently, make certain that it's not just about books, it's about, you know, what you um, read to sort of help you become confident. Um, and I think at a very, very sort of younger age, I wish I had that opportunity to read more earlier. Mm, mm. Thank you. Because I, 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 I'm gathering from that, that reading helps to open your eyes to new horizons. It broadens your, your, your aspect, where you're thinking, where you can potentially go. So you can challenge more. And, and, and be, uh, am I right in that? Yes, partly. Reading gives you the skills to be able to look objectively, to be able to understand um, so much, particularly if it is an academic route that you are um, thinking about. Mm -hmm. The earlier, as much, of that that you do as possible will assist with all that um, academic writing on some of those modules that I have taught on previously, like social justice, um, those sorts of areas um, reading widely helps. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jen. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you. I'm going to connect you with Sarah EQ because I know she's starting her new research stuff and I think the two of you could connect and could really um, make some real changes happen across both institutions. So um, all I can say is another really big, big thank you. Okay. And thank you for having me on your platform. No, it's, it Not really is a pleasure. It, the pleasure is really mine. I'm going to just um, advertise what's happening um, for next week. Um, um, but I'm just, we'll just, we'll, and then we'll close. And just next week, we're going to have um, Rodney Williams, who's a young man who's a, a lead um, project manager for um, national, the National Grid. And he's got a fascinating story as well. Um, and if you haven't seen, or if you want to catch up with any of the previous belonging interviews which we've done then please go to our tiny url um, um dot com forward slash belonging it's on our youtube site and you can catch this one and any one that we've done previously um all i can say is have a good weekend and i will see you again next week and jan another big big thank you thank you